welcome. This is Creating Accessible Word Documents. And this is a presentation that um, is basically meant to um, augment Kelly Kogor, our Director of Support Services and Accessibilities, uh, initial um, discussion with campus departments about making their course and coursework accessible. And we are starting to talk today about making Word documents accessible. And Bob is going to help navigate the slides for me, as well as Katie is going to be recording. So without further ado, I just want to go to the focal points. And before I do, I want to introduce myself. My name is Mimi O'Malley. I am with the Collaboratory in conjunction with Bob. We're here to help faculty with any of their course or um, course design needs. Um, I want to talk about today, we are going to focus though, this particular training on Microsoft Word 2010 or higher. And these are all the computer software that is loaded on most of our campus computers, be that faculty, staff, or even here in the library. Um, if you have an older version of Word, some of the features of this presentation may not be applicable. Um, in that case, you can always contact us here in the library collaboratory and we can see if we can help you out as far as with accessibility. Today's presentation is going to focus on the syllabus. And the reason being is this is in conjunction with the um, university's initiative to make syllabi accessible for session two. Now, we also know that most faculty use Word for handouts, study guides, lecture notes, and even presentation scripts. So this can be a training very useful for those items as well. Key attributes we're going to cover today that are important for your Word accessibility is headers using Microsoft Word styles. We're also going to cover alt text descriptions, especially relevant for images and tables. And then we're going to also discuss tables and setting up tables, especially in relation to alt text description, as well as their header. Um, I'll also preview the accessibility checker, which is a fantastic feature in the Word 2010 or higher um, office products. And finally, I'll round out today's presentation with the difference between saving a Word document as a DOC or DOCX versus a PDF and how that may impact screen readers. So, without further ado, um, before we actually get started, I want to demo a syllabus that I use for a spring course on multimedia instruction. And while this is going through JAWS, I want you to kind of pick out any kind of errors, omissions, uh, possible strange things that a screen reader may do. Okay? Items new multi select list box, syllabus underline or in word format, 9 slash 15 slash 2014, 338 pm, Microsoft Word document 63 kb 306, table 1, non uniform table, graphics folding, new logo, dialogue, up down select. Oh, I'm sorry. Table 1, non uniform table, graphics folding, new logo 1.86 inches wide by 1.67 inches high, row 1 to 1. Column 102, syllabus underline or word format dash word. The document has one object. Edit. What's the? Um, I think it's insert ball. down, Bob. Try that. Let's see. Insert and then you're down, but. Yeah. Slash heading level four Spalding University. Heading level four College of Education. Educator as leader. Table two. Not uniform table. In keeping with the Spalding University pioneer spirit of service and the tradition of collaborative commitment to the development of the total person, the College of Education has as its mission the preparation of educators who will possess intellectual understanding, holistic perspective, and professional skills to lead others to the maximum use of their potential for lifelong learning in multicultural society. Row 2. Number of comments changed to 2 from 1. Term slash year. Summer 2014. Row 3. Course title left parent credit hours right parent. Multimedia applications for teaching and learning. Row 4. Course number left parent as right parent. Edu 379 left parent. Edu 379 SA right parent. Row 5. 
College slash School of Program, College of Education and Dash Initial Certification Program, text 1 edit throw 6, time left parent as right parent location, 05 slash 12 slash 14 dash 06 slash 19 slash 14 lecture Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, 12.30 p.m. dash 2, 10 p.m. Mansion 307, row 7. Instructor, Mimi O'Malley, row 8. Office hours, Monday, 2.15 p.m. dash 3.15 p.m. And by appointment, row 9. Office location, library lower level 023, row 10. Number of columns changed to 3 from 2. Contact information, office colon 502-873-4383. Email colon, link, momily at spalding.edu. Table 4, uniform table, row 1. Week, assignment, due date, where to submit, row 2. 1, W1 discussion forum, May 18th. 11th colon 55 p.m. EST Moodle row 3 glossary May 18th 11th colon 55 p.m. EST Moodle row 4 bibliography May 18th 11th colon 55 p.m. EST Live text row 5 2 W2 discussion forum May 25th 11th colon 55 p.m. EST Moodle table 5 uniform table row 1 resources slash bibliography left parent optional right parent out of table Bergman J and Sam's A left parent 2012 right parent flip your classroom colon reach every student in every class every day Eugene or colon international society for technology and education the Monty T left parent 2013 right parent Interactive whiteboards in the elementary classroom. Eugene or Colin International Society for Technology and Education left parent, nice to right parent. Okay. So that at least gives you an idea of what JAWS, how it works, what it reads. I guess the question now, is there anything you found that was odd, um, maybe a blatant error or an omission? Anything that you thought may have been strange that JAWS picked up on or didn't pick up on at all? Oh, first of all, what is JAWS? What okay, I have to apologize. JAWS is a screen reader. Okay. So what this basically did is we set this document up so it would be read by JAWS. Okay. JAWS is used by visually impaired students to read text documents. Okay. Um, so, I mean, my first impression is it was really fast and at times hard to understand. Okay. All right. Take a look at the office hours and colors. Um, it didn't pick up red either. Like if you know, right. I don't know if you picked up. It never really went over and said it was a red color. Right. Same thing with the uh, email. I guess the saying that it was, or it did not say that it was blue. Did it? it? No. And you bring up a good point with email. It pretty much read mo Molly at Spalding U dot U E U. Mm -hmm. um, it didn't pick up the color in the table. Um, if you look down even in the citations, it did not pick up like italicized in the title. And when it, um, in the publishing state, it picked, it just read it as or, mm -hmm. not Oregon. Um, the reason I want to point this out is one is to just uh, demonstrate how JAWS reads when it is read by a screen reader. And also I want to point out that some of the errors or omissions that we don't cognitively think it will read or we assume it will read, it does not pick up. It's very literal. And with citations, for those of faculty who are real, I would say, authenticists with citation, it can be a challenge then if a student can't read a proper citation, how that student in turn is going to submit a citation properly if they don't hear it correctly from a screen reader. So those are just a few items I want to point out and just really show a demonstration of how to use JAWS. What I do want to now turn attention to is go over into our actual presentation. So Bob's going to unplug that. And we're going to start with looking at the next slide on headers. And good heading structure is probably the most important accessibility consideration. Now, if you're like me, I don't use MS Word styles. I pretty much will open up a Word document, start typing. Um, if I want to boldface the sub subtitles, um, if I want to change the font type, font size, I will do it automatically. The problem with that 
is that there's no real structure to the actual Word document, and that structure is important to be discerned by a screen reader. For a screen reader to read a PDF effectively, the document must have logical structure and a reading order. And this logical structure and reading order actually comes from behind the scenes elements, which are called tags. The advantage to this structure is when a document such as this is exported to either HTML as a web page or as PDF because the structure using Microsoft styles will give tags to text characters and that structure then is retained and can be discerned by screen readers. Um, styles will also emphasize co when colors cannot. So as we saw in the previous example, it didn't read red, but it could be that if we chose a style that emphasized um, a color, it may have picked up on that. And another important thing about um, headers is you want a high to low font color contrast. Um, essentially black against white is one of the best, or dark blue against white uh, is really the important um, attribute as well. All right, Bob's going to go to the next slide and I want to show you where our styles located. Um, and again, just to recap, best way to start your Word document is to do it as you normally would do right now, is you just go ahead and type your text normally. Um, if you do have subtitles, um, subheadings, go ahead and you know put those in as you normally would. But before you actually save your document, go ahead and use the Word Styles ribbon to actually change your text as well as your titles or headings in your document. And so what Bob's going to do now is go actually into a Word document and show you where that styles ribbon is. All right. And notice at the very top of our ribbon, we have the styles located. And Bob, for just purpose of demonstration, if you want to take any of the title, um, like Spalding University, and if you want to go ahead and just change that to whatever you feel. With Bob doing that, he is now setting up tags. Um, even though that's behind the scenes, it's really creating a structure for the Word document. Okay, And then, Bob, when you're all done, go ahead and just copy any kind of selection of text, like the verb is perfect. And then he's going to go ahead and just select the styles with that. So right, those actions there are at least giving structure and logical order to the document. Again, when you're done saving this, you'll want to save it ideally as a PDF, but we'll get to that in, towards the latter part of the demonstration. Okay. Now, um, I'm going to have Bob go ahead and go back to the PowerPoint. Thank you, Bob. And we are going to go ahead and move into alt text. Um, goes without saying, many of us like to put pictures, clip art, logos, photographs, cartoons, um, even smart art into our Word docs. So for any of those type of uh, visual representations, they're going to need an alt text description. You can also use alt text description for shapes, but not shapes that contain text or shapes that are in groups. Oftentimes, smart art or those type of text in groups. You may also want to add a sentence description prior to the actual image. So that sentence description actually forewarns the user that there's going to be an image or a visual representation coming up. Now, I want to make you aware that there's no currently way of adding alternative text to Word, to images in Word for Mac. All right. However, if you do find that there is change to that, please let us know in the collaboratory. But based on the research we could find, if you use Word for Mac, there isn't a way to add alt text image directly in a Word document. However, there is a workaround. 
you can take advantage of the fact that Mac has the ability to print in a PDF. So then if you do that, you can use Adobe Acrobat to add alt text to images in Mac for Word PDF document. Okay? Do you mind if I ask you a question? Go uh, ahead, Bob. I, is, is, uh, do you have to, would any Adobe Acrobat reader work, or do you have to have the full-blown Acrobat? Acrobat program? Um, the best of my knowledge, it is the Adobe Acrobat program, but I have not tested. So I would gather it probably. Correct. Requires correct. The so the editing program. Yeah. Okay. Correct. So if you do not have the Adobe Acrobat editing program, you may find that you may not be able to add alt text image because that feature may not be there, but it is worth taking a look at if you do have. Adobe Acrobat, searching for that. Okay, so how do you actually add alt text to an image? Well, what you do is you essentially right click on the image itself. You will have a drop down menu that says format picture. That will open up a new window. The window is going to give you two options. It's going to have you input a title and a description. The title is not critical. And the reason for that is if the document is ever exported as an HTML, like a web page, the title may not be saved. The description, however, is critical. That will be saved. And the important part about a description is you want a clear and concise description. So for example, if you have an image of a car that's red in color, you want to have red Ferrari versus red car. It just gives much more detail for the visual learner. So Bob is going to show you how this actually looks before we actually go out and do it in Word. So again, um, you'll click on the image. That's the text box in what it shows. Down at the very bottom you'll see the format picture. That will open up a new kind of window. Uh, the alt text is kind of discriminately hidden but it's usually a third icon with, it looks like a cross in the middle. And from there, you'll select alt text. Again, it will open up a new box where you're going to input your actual information. And so what Bob's gonna do is go on over into our Word document, and he's gonna take a look at an image. I think the last time, you may wanna do, you wanna do the logo, Bob? Up top. Okay, so typical Spalding logo, and at the very bottom, and what Bob did is actually open up that little crossbar box, and then he selects format picture. Again, it opens up this particular field. He selects the other icon with kind of the arrows in the form of a cross, and notice he has not filled out a title, which is fine, because it may not export if it's, this does become a web page. But notice how he's got very detailed Spalding New Logo. It says Spalding University Established 1814. This definitely tells the reader what it is. When you are finished, be sure you actually save the format picture. Unfortunately, Bob may not be able to get the entire um, screen here, so you're not seeing the OK but I just want to point out, um, be sure you save it, selecting OK. Where is that? Where would that show up on uh, The OK would usually be at the very bottom of that format picture text box, mm -hmm. uh, usually in the bottom, either right or left. Okay. It's, it's pretty obvious okay. on there. OK. So Bob's going to now move over into um, uh, <laughs> tables. Tables, back in our presentation. I do want to add that while Bob's moving over, content may not read exactly the same way for each person, especially what you have written in the description field. And that can be de dependent on the assistive technology that's used, such as what the screen reader the student's using. It can also be the configurations that the student may have on his or her screen reader. So sometimes if the description does not read entirely verbatim, it could have to do with the actual screen reader and the configurations of that. All right, so the third uh, 
factor that we want to make sure our Word documents have are tables. If you don't have tables in your Word document, you can move on from this. But for syllabi, most time you're going to have it for your grading policy. Um, some faculty may also put their course schedules in there as well. The key about tables are you want them to be as simple as possible, ideally linearized. Essentially, that means red left to right, top to bottom. You want to avoid using tables with large blocks of text as well as images in the actual table cells. If you have images in the table cells, they need to have alt text description for each image. If you're going to use large blocks of text, it's better to actually put it in an Excel spreadsheet than in a Word table. And to give you an idea, if you are going to have a table that's going to consist of more than five rows or columns, it's ideal to then use Excel. It's kind of a point of reference. You really want to stay away from using tables to lay out content. You only want to use it for small amounts of data. Okay. Now, with tables, there are essentially two parts to keep in mind. The first part is you actually want to give some type of an alt text description for the table. And the way to do that will be you'll be using the table tools layout button, followed by its properties, and then alt text. The second part is you're going to identify table headers. And this actually helps so if your table goes more th on more than one page, it will keep the format and structure together. For creating or identifying table headers, again, you're going to use the table tools layout, followed by the properties, then row, and then repeat as row. So Bob's going to go to the next slide, and this kind of gives a little bit more of a better illustration. Again, number one on this slide will show you how to actually set up the alt text description. Again, you'll start with table tools, layout, followed by properties, and then you'll actually go into the actual item table itself, especially that little um, uh, cross in the box. You'll click on that, and that will open up your alt text description window. In number two, this demonstrates how to actually identify your table header. Again, you start with your table layout, the properties, that will open a new box. You'll have different tabs. You'll want to select the row tab. By default, the allow row to break across pages will be checked. Now, when a row contains a page break, Part of the row will be seen on the first page. The other part of the row will be seen on the second page. Now, that can present a problem for screen readers because it may not read it properly. So, we want to uncheck the allow row to break across pages to avoid that from breaking logical structure. You'll notice, though, in number two, it's highlighted repeat as header row at the top of the page. That repeat as header row not only identifies the header for screen readers, but the header will also repeat for very long tables that continue on to another page. So Bob's actually going to go over into our Word document, and we're going to illustrate once again how to do alt text. And there you go. Yeah, let's see here. Perfect. Uh, that's the wrong one. Okay, there we go. Okay. Okay, yeah, but that's okay. If you go to table properties from this menu, that's perfectly fine. It's a right click, in other words, rather than going to the top. True. Right click. Um, from here, you'll notice the alt text tab is already opened up. Notice we don't have a title because if that ti this table is exported to an HTML, the title may drop, but there is a very descriptive text that denotes the t what the table is, and it also describes the table rows and the columns. All right? And be sure when you do that, you save OK when you take it, which Bob's got. And then Bob, if you can click on the row tab, ribbon, perfect. 
Okay, this illustrates when we're identifying the table headers. And again, we want to uncheck allow row to break across pages, but we do want it to check repeat as header row across the top page. And then we can go ahead and select OK. Now, allow is the default, right? So yes, that's you correct. To, uh, right. I don't want to mislead you here by thinking that it was already checked. It won't be. Okay. That's correct. Okay. Bob's correct. Okay. So, um, as we go back to the presentation, I want to point out a great feature in the Office 2010 and higher. And this is Accessibility Checker. And what happens is Accessibility Checker actually runs as you are typing your draft. It will um, point out potential challenges, as well as it will provide some remediation suggestions. Now, I do want to point out that it may not work if you save your Word document as a rich text format, or RTF. Um, I found it problematic. However, if you find it works for you, please let us know. We can change that. But from what we've tried to do and our troubleshooting, it didn't work well. So, um, Bob's going to go ahead and go to the next slide where he's going to show you what Accessibility Checker is. When you select in your Word document file, it brings you to this particular screen that has, of course, where you save, save as, print. It will also have a check for issues kind of link. When you select that, you'll see a check accessibility option. By clicking on check accessibility, it will open up a new text box. And from there, you can see accessibility checker gives you inspection results. It's gonna tell you where the problems are. Um, it will also give you why that's a problem, and then below it's going to show how to fix it. Now, we're going to go ahead, Bob, and if you can go over to Word and actually we'll demonstrate what this looks like. So here's our Word document. We're going to go to File, and Check for Issue is right below that. Inf oh, I'm sorry, Bob, you can't see it too well. <laughs> um, keep going down and a little bit over to your right. Yeah, perfect and check for accessibility. Okay, and notice how on the inspection results, it's highlighting what the issues are. All right. When it's highlighted, it will also show below why it needs to be fixed and how to fix it. So this is really, really handy for faculty if they wanna do a really once over um, before you hit the save button, um, check over of a document. I do want to give you a heads up. This particular document was actually created with all tables. So all of the text content is actually in a table format, which is not the best use of tables. You really don't want to put a lot of text in tables. But I did want to give you an idea of why in accessibility checker, it keeps pulling up table rows and table because the content is built in tables. Just a little side note there. Okay, so let's see here. Bob, when you get to perfect, we're back in our presentation. And I want to kind of uh, round out by talking about what's kind of the difference between saving your Word document as a normal Word DOC DOCX, or even rich text. Well, for a screen reader, by saving it in its normal format, um, you may, the user who's using a screen reader may need to manually advance using up and down arrows, all right? Also, you may have alt text description problems. And what do I mean by that? If you have an image in with an alt text description in a saved MS Word document, the image may not be in focus to your actual cursor, and thus it won't be read by the screen reader. So in order for JAWS to read an image in a saved MS Word document, the user may actually manually have to put their cursor over the image 
and then actually use control, shift, and the letter O. So it's, this is just an example of where the user may have to do more manual um, manipulation to read tables, images, etc. when you have an MS Word document saved as a DOC, DOCX, or RTF. Another really helpful use is to add a brief lead-in sentence before you actually have an image, table, um, graph, map, etc. This really kind of forewarns the reader who's using a screen reader that something's coming up that's visual that needs to be read. Okay, so let's talk about saving a Word doc as a PDF. This is really the preferred, and the reason is when your Word doc is set up with the logical structure and reading order, it has those behind the scenes elements called tags, and that screen reader will pick up those tags and will automatically advance, for the most part, the document. That user will not need to manually manipulate the original text to advance it, the screen reader. Most often times your alt text descriptions will be read as they were intended, especially in the PDF. Now, I want to caution. Um, Kelly may have mentioned in some summer sessions when she was talking to departments about keeping your coursework accessible. She may have talked about journal articles that you may receive, either downloaded off the internet or maybe you received from another library. These are called image-only PDFs. And essentially with an image-only PDF, they, the, um, the original document was scanned. And with that scan, all it did is create a picture or a graphic image. It didn't pick up on necessarily any kind of tags. So a screen reader in an image-only PDF will only see this image it won't necessarily pick up the actual text. So, unless you know that that original text was properly set up in a logical structure, more than likely than not, a scanned PDF you receive that you haven't originally created, probably 99% of the time will not be screen reader accessible. There is a product, or I should say a tool, called an optical character recognition software. And that is an electronic device that can go over image-only PDFs and convert it to machine-readable format. But OCRs are, there's only one known right now on campus, so they're not loaded on all campus-wide computers, and certainly they are probably not loaded on all faculty computers. So I just want to caution, if you're receiving journal articles from maybe an outside library, um, or you pull off a PDF from the internet, more likely than not, go with the assumption that that may not be screen reader um, formatted, okay? If there's anything to walk away from today is the fact that the key to accessibility of a PDF document really depends on the accessibility of that original document when it was created and those tags were formed. Another thing to keep in mind with screen readers as a whole, their full functionality really does depend on the most updated version that the user has. So if a user is using a screen reader that hasn't had an update, they may not be able to get the full functionality of especially alt text description and your ta identifying table headers. So that can also impact what they see. Uh, let's see here. Da, da, da. I want to now move into taking that original syllabus that we started off today's presentation and based on the headers um, and the alt text description and the uh, setting up the tables properly, Bob's actually going to show you how it should read as a saved PDF. It takes a little bit of time to load in the screen reader. Edit. Type in text. 
document page has one heading and one link. Syllabus underlined accessible word format dot PDF graphic two. Table with three columns and twelve rows. Spalding University College of Education educator as leader in keeping with the Spalding University pioneer spirit of service and the tradition of collaborative commitment to the development of the total person. The College of Education has as its mission the preparation of educators who will possess intellectual understanding, holistic perspective, and professional skills to lead others to the maximum use of their potential for lifelong learning in multicultural society. Term slash year summer 2014 course title left parent credit hours right parent multimedia applications for teaching and learning course number left parent s right parent edu 379 left parent edu 379 sa right parent college slash school and program college of education and dash initial certification program time left parent s right parent location may 5th 2014 to june 19th 2014 Lecture Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, 12.30 p.m. 2.10 p.m. Mansion 307 Instructor Mimi O'Malley Office Hours Monday, 2.10 to 3 p.m. or by appointment only office location library lower level 023 contact information office colon 502-873-4383 email colon link mobile at spalding.edu table end graphic picture of Spalding University logo Graphic 225. Table with four columns and five rows. Week assignment due date where to submit one W1 discussion forum May 18th, 11th, colon 55 p.m. Eastern Standard Time Moodle 1 Glossary May 18th, 11th, colon 55 p.m. Eastern Standard Time Moodle 1 Webliography May 18th, 11th, colon 55 p.m. Eastern Standard Time Live Text 2W2 Discussion Forum May 25th. 11th colon 55 p.m. Eastern Standard Time Moodle Table and Heading Level 1 Resources Slash Bibliography Left Parent Optional Right Parent Bergman J and Sam's A Left Parent 2012 Right Parent Flip your classroom colon reach every student in every class every day Eugene or colon International Society for Technology and Education Okay, so as you can see Bob did no manual advancing it pretty much scrolled the page um, there were some hitches you could see again, uh, Eugene, Oregon, it did pick up the or, but it, by spelling out, for example, um, May, um, 12th, 2014 to June 19th, it read it much more logically. Uh, also, um, by setting up our table Silver construction, we did try to at least provide, you know, Eastern Standard Time spell that out instead of EST. Um, anything you find that was unusual or if you could see the difference between the two that I haven't maybe already pointed out. One thing I do want to follow up with is we will have um, handouts on Word, text, how to actually do this on the collaboratory page which is located within the library uh, web page. So if you go to the Spalding University Library web page you will see a collaboratory link. We will upload actual handouts for how to actually go about setting up your heading structure, alt text, as well as your table tables. We also will put in a link to a syllabus checklist so that if you want to make sure you've covered everything, this checklist can be a great ready reference as well. And is there anything, Bob, you'd like to add? Well, uh, we, of course, spend a lot of time running syllabi through JAWS because uh, we find that our observation, you know, trust our observations. Um, and so I would just suggest that an awful lot of having an accessible syllabus depends upon common sense. As you're developing your uh, syllabus, think about what uh, what it would sound like if someone were reading it to you. And as many times as we do this, uh, I noticed this time through that uh, that when we got down to uh, the room numbers, we don't say mansion room number 307. You know, so. Th things like that will, you know, sort of pop out at you, and I don't know if it would even be helpful to have someone sort of read it to you and let 
let you uh, sort of hear what it sounds like. It might be a good technique. Mm -hmm. But that's really the only thing I might uh, sort of augment this great presentation with and is that think just logically, you know. And I just want to dovetail, Bob, if you can go back to the PowerPoint, because I want to make sure Gerlinda knows who to contact if you do have a student who needs accommodations. Just one more slide over, Bob. Um, if you do have a student who does identify them as needing accommodations, Kelly Kogor is our Director of Student Support. Mm -hmm. Her number is there. She's located in the mansion. I don't want to say room because I don't know offhand, but um, it is in the campus directory. If you have any question about tools, the technology, if you find something about M Microsoft Mac or Word for Mac that we did not present in this presentation, by all means share it with us. We'd love to have, um, and certainly we know other people out there are using other tools that we are not aware of and would love to know more about them. Um, Bob is here if you have further questions also about um, accessibility for Word documents, as is a, my colleague Janice Poston as well. Um, but I just thought at least you've got two right there. We will be happy to put these slides on the Collaboratory webpage as well. So for individuals who want additional um, background of what was presented here, we'll put those slides available.